Hi students, welcome to HSC Earth and Environmental Science and Module 6 on Hazards. This is video number 3. We're going to be looking at hazards and earthquakes. Once again, as is the case with a lot of these particular um, learning intentions, what we want you to do is to use secondary sources to investigate and explain the hazards associated with earthquakes, specifically looking at ground motion and tsunamis. So I'll be trying to make sure that you know how to describe a hazard associated with earthquakes and to contrast some of the things that we know about ground motion and tsunamis. And ultimately what we want you to do from here as your base and then in the work that you'll complete in class, to be able to discuss several different hazards associated with earthquakes. So the first thing that we need to do is to define hazards. And a geological hazard is a situation that endangers people and property as a result of a geological process. Now we may also include uh, a look at some of the climatic hazards that may be associated um, with events other than those caused directly or ones that we can relate directly to geological events. For the moment, we just want to focus on some geological hazards, and these are going to include earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, and landslides. So let's have a look at the first of these. So the first one we want to have a look at are earthquakes. And earthquakes are, I guess, going to be split into two main types of hazards, ground shakes and also tsunamis. And these are two very important and very potentially serious consequences of uh, earthquakes and the damage that they can cause. So ground shakes are the result of surface waves. So we looked at the three different types of seismic waves, P waves and the S waves, the primary and the secondary waves are the ones that radiate out from the focus of the earthquake. And then there are surface waves. Surface waves come in two different types. We've, we've often referred to these as L waves. Um, there are love waves, and these are the waves that have a kind of horizontal um, transmission so that they move horizontally and also rally waves and these are more like rolling waves elliptical waves that kind of uh, not quite like the ones you see on the beach where you get this sort of circular pattern but it's more of an ellipse and I've kind of given you a little bit of an idea of how these might look um, in the diagram that's on this particular slide. But you can see that what happens is if these sorts of waves are at the surface, they're going to do some damage. They're not going to be great if you're standing on the surface, but they're going to also be uh, particularly concerning uh, if you're inside of the building that's actually shaking in this kind of a way. One of the things that we want to do with ground shakes is we want to try and measure the damage or at least the potential for damage on the basis of four important criteria. Those four important criteria are the severity, and we talked a little bit about that in earthquake magnitudes in the previous video. Attenuation, which is basically how long it takes for something to drop, so the intensity of something to drop. So as the um, earthquake wave radiates out from the focus, some of that energy is lost. You can, you can describe attenuation by uh, you know, standing on an end of a field and having someone stand next to you and kind of screaming at them and having them move further and further back at some point, you might be screaming with the same volume, but they're going to be too far away. The energy is dissipating as it gets further and further away from the source. And that's what we mean by attenuation. How much is the strength of these particular waves um, diminishing over distance? Duration is obviously important. How long the wave is shaking is going to determine whether or not the structures are going to be able to cope with that sort of um, length of time and also the response of the location sometimes called the site response and this can um, I guess depend on a number of factors the type of bedrock the type of soils that might be present whether or not we're looking at any sort of uh, water features associated with the land and so we can get things like surface faulting, cracking in the rocks. We can get landslides, where the, where the, um, like you can kind of see in the backdrop of this particular slide, where whole sections just kind of fall away. And also mud flows or liquefaction, where uh, effectively, either based on the types of soils that we have, uh, or maybe some of the heat that's generated, we end up with something that is traveling where maybe solid particles are actually traveling uh, and behaving as they would if they were a liquid. 
And of course, this can cause great damage because they're more capable of flow. They flow more easily. They may flow over a wider range and they can um, cause damage through smothering, through um, just covering certain areas. So these are a couple of the important consequences of ground shakes. The other problem that's as often associated with earthquakes is tsunamis. And tsunamis are basically series of waves that um, are very high in terms of their magnitude that actually move onto the uh, land, move through the shoreline onto the land. They may not always be as dramatic as the ones in this particular backdrop. Um, they may just be one to two meters in height, but they have incredible power. They are very, very energetic. They seem to occur most commonly in the Pacific, um, although one of the ones that's quite famous is the one that occurred uh, the Boxing Day tsunami that occurred in Indonesia, and that was more of uh, the Indian Ocean rather than the Pacific Ocean. That particular tsunami, which is one we'll have a look at a little bit more in class, had an uh, incredible death toll, uh, and obviously coming straight after Christmas, a very, very devastating effect, not just on that community, but on so many of the other communities around them. Whilst it's not always true that it's only earthquakes that can cause tsunamis, there could be a, a, a meteorite impact, for example, that, that displaces a huge amount of water that could create a tsunami. What we do know is that there are certain types of undersea earthquakes that can, as a result of that sudden slipping, uh, displace large amounts of water. And that's what we're after, a large amount of water that's actually going to radiate in that wave-like fashion away from that um, impact place or away from that focal point. The waves travel quickly until they reach shallow water and then they slow down. And so what happens as they slow down is the waves behind them start to catch up. They start to compress and that creates this um, lifting of the water and the surge towards the shore. So when it breaks, it often breaks um, beyond the beach line and into potentially some of the buildings uh, or structures that are beyond the beach line. So they can be incredibly powerful and they can be incredibly destructive. Now there's also a few more types I guess we can look at. Um, I very briefly mentioned tsunamis, um, landslides, and some of the other consequences, mud flows, uh, surface faulting that are associated with earthquakes that can create um, not just hazards for people, but potentially disasters as well. And we'll have a look in future videos at the distinction between those two uh, terms. But for now, we want you to have a little bit of a look at the energy that's associated with different earthquake magnitudes. And there's a great little activity, which is one of the ones that Gary Lewis has shared on his very valuable website. Lots of great tips and tricks and also fantastic information um, about geological science on that particular site, G-O-E-T-C. Uh, but that's what we're going to be doing in class, having a little bit of a look at the earthquake magnitudes with some bundles of spaghetti. How we're going to do that, you'll see in class. Thanks for watching.